event kind of came, all came about because we had a gentleman in the audience, Al Petrovich, who had a contact with uh, Sheriff Mack, and he uh, approached us and said, you know, do you think it'd be a great idea to have, see if we could get him here to Humboldt County. So um, I'm going to ask Al to come up and introduce him for us. So, Al? Good evening, and uh, welcome to Pertunis Veterans Memorial Building, an honorable place for us to meet. Right away, I want to thank the Humboldt Tea Party Patriots for sponsoring our guest speaker. That made my day. Thank you to Doris Morgan and Wayne Morris and all the Tea Party Patriots. I think that many people feel that things have strayed very far from we thought that our country was meant to be, and that it is frustrating to watch it happen. The strings are being pulled from far away, and at times it seems our efforts go unnoticed and fall to the wayside. We would like to have control of our lives and live as a free people. Our guest speaker will share with us his experiences that may give us some insight in how we in our local community could function. Our guest speaker is a former Grand County, Arizona Sheriff. He's a longtime crusader for freedom and individual rights. In 1984, he filed a lawsuit challenging the Brady Bill to stop the federal government from forcing another unfunded mandate on the states. Eventually, this went to the Supreme Court. And, uh, at the Supreme Court, he prevailed. He won the decision. And I, and I think that in my uh, scouring of the internet, that this is what really captured my eye uh, about Sheriff Mack. I actually downloaded the Supreme Court decision in 17 pages. It was, the opinion was delivered by Justice Scalia. And um, it contained a whole lot more than I could ever have expected. It, it really lined up uh, how our government is supposed to function. Here, here's where a judge stood up and did what he was supposed to do. So, um, our guest speaker tonight is the author of several books, but I think he is going to share that with us. And one of them, so you don't have to read all this, in legal ease is this little handout booklet that highlights what it says. And it's, it's very impressive. I hope you all take the time and realize how important it is for everyone in the county and in the state and across the nation. So I don't want to wait any longer. I want him to come out and share his experiences, what he's learned, and what he can perhaps guide us to do here locally. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Sheriff Richard Mack. Thank you so much. Uh, first time ever in uh, Redwood country for me. Uh, I keep telling people I've been to Redding several times, and they said, that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. Okay, well, I, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've been flying where the uh, uh, clerk at the uh, airport in San Francisco said, we might make it to Eureka, and we might not. <laughs> and if we can't land, we're just coming right back. And when I looked out the window, I said, we're not landing. Because all I could see was white cloud. And I said, where I come from, you can't land. And uh, the, guy, the pilot came on and said, we're going to land. Uh, there's actually some visibility down there. <laughs> so I didn't believe him, but it looked like it, our, all our prayers were answered. Uh, I was really wanting to be here. And I thank all of you for being here. Uh, just, just by way of... Uh, commercial message before we get going on anything else. Um, the book that you'll see back at the table, I'll be signing those afterwards for anyone who would like to get a couple of them. The, the County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. 
And uh, this book was actually born out of the 2008 election because I got so depressed watching my country die during that process of John McCain and Hillary Clinton and, and Barack Obama that uh, it actually prompted me to write something that was positive and, and hopeful and, and that's actually about freedom and that there still is hope for freedom in America. But it's not in Washington, D.C. You're going to have to do it at the local level. And there is a way. And it's all constitutional, and it's peaceful, and it's effective to keep the federal government off your backs and to make them, and to literally make the corruption of Washington, D.C. irrelevant. Okay? And it can happen county by county and state by state. It'll never happen in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is bought and paid for. And uh, so there's not much hope there. And then just as Al was saying, um, this little booklet's probably the most powerful little booklet you can have in your life. This is a synopsis of the Mac Prince Supreme Court decision where two small town sheriffs sued the Clinton administration, sued our own government, and won a case at the United States Supreme Court. This is all the highlights of the decision. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but what's on the cover? The flag of every state. All 50 flags. Because it's all about state sovereignty. And tonight's message, I will prove to you that state sovereignty is real. It's constitutional. It's the ultimate check and balance. And it also bestows the responsibility on the state's and counties and any other elected official anywhere in your state, county, city, school board, whatever, that they all have the responsibility to protect and defend your freedom. And we're going to go over that to where you will understand exactly what I'm saying and I'm going to show you the evidence of that tonight. And I've been a detective, I've been in law enforcement a long time, so I don't want you to just hear me spout off. I want you to see the evidence. And this is the easiest way, you should really get several of these and pass them to people that you've already argued with, that the federal government cannot tell the states what to do. And you can show them a Supreme Court decision that's all based on our history, our constitution, and Scalia actually does something really strange here. He actually quotes the Founding Fathers and the Federalist Papers and the Constitution in a decision about constitutional propriety. And uh, totally amazing. And the only other booklet that I've ever found that is, is more powerful than this one that fits in your pocket is the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And these should go hand in hand. Just get, see, read this and then tell me. Okay? Because when I was a rookie cop, I actually made that mistake. I read the Constitution. And I examined the Constitution on one hand, and looked what government was doing on the other, and I saw no similarity whatsoever. And so I, that's when I decided that I wasn't going to be part of the problem anymore. And uh, you'll see about that too. And uh, I'll have to tell you, there's a couple of my books, one that we already ran out of because all these people we have lunch with decided they want to buy all my other books. So. And I didn't bring it up, and I, my wife's going to get mad at me again because she already thought, make sure you take my book. I didn't. So anyway, the book is entitled, From My Cold, Dead Fingers, Why America Needs God. Yep. Now, why would a law enforcement officer say something like that? Because I saw too many times when people didn't have it. And you should. And you know why you should? Because you can. And because you're American. And because guns are all about one thing and one thing only. Freedom. And I don't hunt and I never have. But every time they make another gun control law, I go buy two more. <laughs> They're not going to tell me I can't have a gun. They're just not. Okay? And uh, so, uh, you'll have to go to my website to get the other one. That's uh, sheriffmac.com. And if you'd like to hear my daughter singing what they gave me for my Christmas present, 
you can go there too and see that. So to go to shepherdmag.com, go to the menu. My two daughters sang uh, a song to me from the play, Broadway play Wicked. And it's on the menu, and you just go to on a personal note. And you'll see my two daughters dressed up as Alphaba and Galinda. And that was one of my wishes before I died, so I hope I'm not dying soon because they did it. And they gave it to me for Christmas, and you can hear it. And uh, it's a fantastic song. And they always get mad at me every time I say that about them. Anyway, it was very touching. And uh, this, this right here is the same as this. But this is me reading the book to you. Okay? It's me. Okay? I didn't hire somebody. It's me. So I've had some blind friends ask me for the book on CD. And some other people say, I never have time to read anything, but I'm always in my car, and I can plug in a CD real easily. So there you go. And they'll, they'll all be back at the table afterwards, and I'll be back there to answer any of your questions. Now, I will tell you that I believe that I'm going to answer most of your questions. So I usually don't do a Q&A. Okay? And, and quite honestly, I'll tell you uh, another reason is there's always somebody who wants to give their own talk. <laughs> and I... And I want to be the last word. Uh, and I want, I want you to feel something when this meeting is done. I want you to feel the spirit of freedom as you leave the room. And I want you to get off on some tangent that somebody else, talk, and, and usually it starts an argument or you know somebody, oh no, that's not true or whatever. I say, look, just examine my books, read the Constitution, and you tell me where I'm wrong. And I've said that to hundreds of sheriffs, judges, lawyers, whoever. Please prove me where I'm wrong. And if you prove me that I'm wrong, so well, I'll, I'll remove it from my presentation and I'll remove it from my book. But this book's two years old. Nobody's done it yet. I guess the most important thing we can ask is what, what would it take for a small town sheriff in southern Arizona, who all he ever wanted to do was be sheriff, what would it take for him to risk his job and home and, and family and everything to sue the federal government of it? And I want to answer that for you in the first part here. And then we're going to get into some of this other stuff that is going to be the evidence that I want you to see relative to this case. This was the most monumental and powerful Tenth Amendment decision in the history of our country. And you haven't heard very much about it, have you? And is, is it your sheriff's job to sue the federal government? You no, know, well, I mean, what is, if I was to say, well, okay, then what's your sheriff's job? Most of them are going to say, oh, well, to protect and serve his citizens. You know, oh, to stop the drug war. Well, even if you were able to do the impossible that we've never been able to do, but even if you were able to finally get rid of drugs in your county, then what would we have? Drug-free tyranny instead of just tyranny. Or drug-ridden tyranny. And, uh, you know, uh, and I don't want to make this about the drug war, but Quite frankly, I, I was in the drug war, and I was an undercover narcotics officer, and I, I can tell you that uh, the drug war is a farce, and it's just more big brother police state type government. And believe me, I don't want people using illicit drugs, uh, or the drugs that we get from doctors, either. Uh, and, and I hate drug abuse. Nobody hates it more than I do. And it's infected all of our families and our society. But we have to be honest enough to address this issue and say what we've been doing is not worth it. And Abraham Lincoln even told us that laws of prohibition don't work. And, and we need to realize that and, and be honest enough to go back to the drawing board on the drug board. So what was it that made me say, uh, I'm going to sue the federal government? Well, I started my police career back in 1977. I'm working my way through college as a part-time meter maid. And I'm trying to get in the FBI. 
because my dad was an FBI and I wanted to follow his footsteps. And that never worked out. And so I thought, well, while I'm waiting uh, to hear from the FBI, I'll, I'm going to get a, a full-time job uh, as a cop. And they might like the experience and see, you know, see that I'm a good law enforcement officer and might uh, make myself more attractive to it. So I hired out full-time where I was working as a part-time meter maid. In 1979, I started as a patrol officer. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, uh, the, the numbers game in law enforcement was something I wasn't going to play second string on. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to write all the tickets, make all the arrests, kick in the doors, and, and I wasn't a mean guy. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't mean. I didn't mistreat people. In fact, I prided myself on when I would give somebody a ticket that they would actually thank me. And uh, yeah, I always thought that was pretty cool if I could get somebody to thank me, you know. And, uh, but I wanted to set records, writing tickets. You know, and there might be some plaque up there to say, oh, Officer Pat set the record for tickets, you know, this year or whatever, you know. And because it was such a numbers game. And I didn't want to disappoint my supervisors who said, you don't get out there and write tickets, you don't bring in, you know. And uh, so I got wrapped up in that. And then in 1982, I was assigned to go undercover. And my feelings towards law enforcement started to change. And how many times do we ask our officers to risk their lives for that stupid weed? And, uh, and it provides no benefit to the community. And so after that, I started kind of questioning a lot of things. And after uh, the court cases were all done, this is about 1983, maybe the beginning of 84. And uh, I'm signed back to patrol for a little while. So what am I doing back on patrol? I'm writing tickets. And I'm at the intersection of 600 West, 300 South, and right next to that intersection is a little elementary school known as Franklin Elementary. And it's a four-way stop. And I'm making notes on my daily activity report, daily EAR. This is before we were computerized, so you had to keep track of where you were on this uh, form. And, and I'm putting on the slash marks of all the tickets I had written that day. And I'm about 50 feet south of the intersection, facing north, and this lady runs a stop sign right in front of me. I'm the only living thing within 300 feet of that intersection, and she runs the stop sign in front of me. I'm in a marked unit. It's not like I'm hiding. It's broad daylight, you know, even though it was about 5 o'clock in the evening, it's still light, and anybody could see a police car sitting right there, she runs through it, and she, she looks really bewildered. She's looking around. She looks at me, and she throws her arms up in the air as if to say, what else could go wrong today? And she immediately pulls over. I don't even have to turn on my red and blue lights. And so I go, all right, another easy ticket for me. She's not even fighting or anything. And I get up to the car. And she already has her license and registration out the window like this. <laughs> and this woman changed my life and never said a word. Not one word. She didn't play the mom card or the, or the wife card like saying, oh, well, so Matt, please don't write me a ticket. Did you see all these kids that I was trying to take care of and they got so crazy and unruly and it was like the Tasmanian devil in here and it didn't look like that a little bit, you know? And it looked like, man, you know, three or four kids looked like 12 or 15, you know, and they were going crazy inside that car. And I could tell what happened. She got so preoccupied trying to settle her kids down that she lost track of where she was on the road, went through the stop sign, looks over at me and pulls over. And she didn't, she didn't play the car like, well, you wouldn't want to write your mom a ticket, would you, for taking care of all you kids? Or the same thing with your wife. How many, how many kids does your wife have? You wouldn't want her to get a ticket for taking care of all your kids. You know, she didn't play anything like that. She's not crying. She's not making excuses. She's not begging for mercy or anything else. She's just staring through this, to the steering wheel, past the steering wheel, and through the windshield. Her kids are still acting up, and she's not there. This woman is really depressed, having a horrible day, and I'm not making it any better. And 
So I just started writing the ticket. You know, somebody who's really dedicated to, you know, protect and serve might, uh, might tell her, look, ma'am, um, I know you've had a hard time here, and I know you didn't mean to run the stop sign, and any idiot would have been able to tell that she couldn't have afforded this ticket if it was $5. She was driving an old, cruddy, compact Datsun station wagon. Datsun. That's how old this was. <laughs> and her kids were very unkempt. And uh, that car was worth $300. And, but you know what? Poor people get in accidents just like rich people or anybody else in between. She's getting a ticket. That's what I'm there for. That's what cops do. But I could have said, look, ma'am, I know your kids were really giving you a hard time. I know you were trying to be mother. I said, in the future, just pull over, take care of your kids, and then drive. Why don't you take them over to the elementary school there and let them get some of that energy out right now? Let them go play for about 15 minutes and then get on with your business and go on down the road. You see, that would be serve and protect instead of sight and destroy. And, and instead, you know, I came up with this term for ticket writing, and I call it taxation through citation. And it's about revenue generation. And we're seeing that right now in San Francisco and other places that are telling their cops to write more tickets because they need the money. And they don't mind doing this on your backs. Okay, and that's where it's at. And so I'm just writing the ticket. And the ticket book was about this big. And here I am writing. And right at the end, you got to sign your name and your serial number. And I did. And then I paused. And now the epiphany starts to come into play. And I looked down at this dejected, depressed, discouraged woman. I looked down at her cruddy old car. I looked down at her snotty nosed kids. And then I looked at me. This was the most penetrating gaze I'd ever felt in my life. And I asked myself a couple of questions. I said, is there anything you're doing here that's helping this family? Is there anything you're doing here that's bringing honor to the badge you wear on your chest? Well, now I'm more discouraged and depressed than she is. <laughs> and I hand her back her license and registration. And now I don't say anything to her. I could have, you know, done a Barney Five thing, you know, and said, well, man, this looks like your lucky day. I'm going to cut you some slack here. I could not do that. Because it may have given her the chance to thank me. And if she had thanked me, it would have only exacerbated my shame. I deserved nothing of the sort. And I left. I always wonder, Sheriff, uh, how long she waited there for me to come back. <laughs> you know? I, I thought, you know, the poor lady, she doesn't know why I left. She doesn't know when I'm coming back. She's probably <laughs> looking around, can I leave? You know? <laughs> but I uh, took that ticket and uh, went about three blocks to the police station, tore it up, violated policy, not supposed to do that, and uh, put it in the trash can. Uh, my sergeant never checked, I guess, on those tickets, and I, I never heard any more about it. But I was wondering, the rest of my shift that night, just a swing shift, got off at 11, I was wondering why I was a cop. And I decided that I needed to start over. Well, I've been working as a cop now for about three and a half years. How do you start all over? Go back to the academy? And all I knew is that I was looking for something. I wanted to find what was important about my job and why I was really a cop and what was I doing out here. And the next day, I come back to work a little bit early. The briefing's at 2.30, and I come in about 2.20, 2.15, and I'm walking around, looking. I don't even know what I'm looking for. And I end up in the clerk, city clerk's office, and I go in there. And she goes, uh, yes, Officer Matt? 
I said, yeah, hi. And I said something to this day, I don't know what. Because it was never a topic of discussion with me or my other cop friends or my family. And I asked something that totally shocked me when I said it. I said, when I took this job, did I take an oath of office? I didn't even remember taking the oath. She goes, well, you sure did. Uh, you signed it. It's in your personnel file. And before I could even ask, she burned me a copy. And I'm reading it. And now I'm going to go quit my job. I'm not kidding. I'm taking off my Sam Brown, and I'm taking off my badge, and I'm going into the chief's office, and I'm leaving it there, and I'm walking out the door. Right then. No kidding. I'm leaving my chosen profession. And as I'm walking from the city side through the lobby over to the police side, I start imagining telling my wife how and why I just quit my job. And she's going, let me see if I got this straight, Matt. You quit your job today. We can't pay the house payment. We can't pay the car payment. We can't pay the kids' new school clothes because you're a liar and a hypocrite. Is that it? I said, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just sitting there standing here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll give you another job. I'm sorry. I can't do this anymore. I can't do that. A job that puts me in that position to where I didn't even care about my own. I took an oath so I could write tickets and so I could have a fun job and I could drive cars as fast as I want, anytime I want. On or off duty. See, we don't write tickets to each other, just to you peasants. So she's sitting there going, okay, uh, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure, go ahead. And remember, this is all just playing out in my mind because I know that little girl. And she goes, you couldn't just quit being a liar and a hypocrite and keep your job. <laughs> now, you ladies see how smart you are? You win the argument and you're not even there. And so I decided to keep my job and quit being a liar and a hypocrite. I put my badge back on, put my Sam Brown back on, go down to briefing, and then I go home. There's the pretty little blonde girl. She goes, what are you doing at home? And I said, I'm getting the world book encyclopedia. And she goes, to go on shift? I said, yeah, the one that says U.S. Constitution. You see, nobody had given me one of these. I didn't have a pocket one of these. Somebody didn't do his job. I wish I would have had one of these. And so, I, uh, I kept the uh, World Book Encyclopedia in my patrol car for about a week. And any time I wasn't on a call, I was reading the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights. And you know, let me ask you, I, I don't think anybody's answered this correctly for me yet. Which of the Bill of Rights, which of the ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution would smack me right in the face if I was a by-the-numbers jerk cop? Always having to write tickets. Which of the Bill of Rights, it's not the fourth, somebody always says the fourth, which one just smacks me right between the eyes? Which one? Some of you have those memorized. Number eight. Somebody want to quote number eight for us real quick? No cruel and unusual punishment, nor excessive fines or bail. Now that's not in the right order, but that's what it says. No excessive fines or bail or cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. And tickets are all free. Oh, how? Well, let's see. Are tickets excessive in their Frequency? Well, they bring in about $7 billion a year, and that's just radar tickets alone. And are the fines a little high? Uh, California has the worst on that. I was uh, talking to people in Fresno not too long ago, I think it was last summer, and this kid came up and he, he rolled through a stop sign out in the wine fields where nobody else is there except this guy hiding behind the wine 
or the great vines, and he writes the kid a ticket, it was $529. And then this guy says, I was going to the same area at 3 o'clock in the morning, not anybody else out there, and yeah, I was doing about 20 over the speed limit, and my fine was $1,126. Do you think it types rocket science to know that that may be as excessive fine or better? That's excessive fine or better. And the people at every level, the people that passed it, the people that enforced it, and the judge that enforces it, all sworn oath to the Constitution. And the Bill of Rights says that stuff is not allowed in America. We do it anyway. Why? Because, oh wait, that's the way we do things. That's the way we've always done it. That's what we're supposed to do. We're cops. We write tickets. Oh, okay. Does that violate your oath ever? Do you think about your oath? Have you ever read the Constitution, officer? I'm going to tell you one thing. I don't believe that there's any way that you can keep your oath if you've never read the Constitution. It's impossible. How are you going to uphold and defend, protect, and preserve the United States Constitution and you've never read it or studied it? And you've never learned about American history. You've never learned about the founding fathers. And so, I'm loving the Constitution. I'm loving the Bill of Rights. And I'm doing this now and it's about three or four months and into my process of learning about the Constitution and American ideals. And a, an announcement comes from Utah Post the state organization that oversees qualifications for cops, and it says, we're announcing a training seminar for all certified cops across the state of Utah. And the title of the seminar was Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers. Wow, okay. And the instructor's name was Dr. W. Cleon Scott. And he used to work in the FBI with my father. And I said, I'm going to that. And in a two-day, 16-hour police training seminar, I don't know what happened to the other 239. There was 240 in the class. I don't know what happened to the other 239, but this one was converted. And Dr. Skousen spoke with the power of God. And I realized that the spirit of freedom was the same as the spirit of God. And I loved every minute that I was there. And I made another oath. I took another oath while I was there. No one else knew in the room or Dr. Scouts, but I took this oath. It was just between me and Almighty God. And I said, I will never be on the wrong side again. And I continued on with my career. And I started getting promoted. And things were going great in our lives. And you know what happens when things are going great in your life. The in-laws call. <laughs> and they did. And they said the most outrageous, nutty thing that my wife and I had ever heard. And this was the first time in our married lives that my wife agreed with me that her parents were crazy. <laughs> because they were telling me that I should move home to Arizona and run for sheriff. Did I want to do that? Maybe when I retired in nine years. I had 11 years on with Pro PD. I could retire at 20. And I said, look, I might consider that when I retire, but I'm not, I'm not leaving here. The kids are happy. The school's just right next door to us. The church is across the street. And I'm getting promoted and things are going great. And everything's fine. Why would we do something like that? And so they kept calling and calling. My wife told them to leave me alone. And then they had other people call them. And so finally I told my wife, I said, look, let's just list all the pros and cons. Show, and so we can show your family, your mom and dad, that we can't do this. And so we listed all the cons. And there was like 23 of them why we could not do this. And there's only two or three why we could. And it was just to be closer to family. Both my wife and I are from the Southern Arizona, Stafford, Pima area, and farming area. And sure, we'd like our kids to be close to the grandparents on both sides. Sure. But not now. It's not going to happen. And we sent that down to them. And about three weeks later, we moved home and ran for sheriff. <laughs> Absolute true story. And to this day, I still don't quite... 
understand it myself. But I haven't been a cop in Arizona. I've been, never been a cop in foreign law enforcement in my home county. And I walked into town and said, I've got some good experience. This is my town. I want to be your sheriff. I was elected. Barely. And uh, four years later, in 1992, I was re-elected. And then in 1993, the wheels start moving about the Brady Bill. And I saw Bill Clinton sign the Brady Bill into law. And when he did, he announced to all of us, <laughs> only the way he can, that the Brady Bill was going to make us so safe in this country that our nation's police won't even need to wear guns anymore. Does that sound like Bill Clinton? Well, that's a propaganda scheme. You see, he and his staff devised that before they even went in. He didn't make that up. They had to have a line to get people on board. And that was the propaganda scheme. I certainly wasn't going to sue him over that, was I? No. I mean, I just thought, oh, that's stupid. Typical Bill Clinton. Usually he's, and in fact, I think he did say, this is for our children. You know? <laughs> and uh, so, then, on January 21st, 1994, we find out what the Brady Bill really is. Four agents of the BATF show up to a Chefs Association meeting in Phoenix. We're all there, and uh, except three sheriffs are not there. There's only 12 sheriffs. There's only 15 counties in Arizona. 12 sheriffs are at this meeting, and three agents of the BATF hand us a document, a 16-page document, that says, Sheriff, we have to give you this because these are your marching orders as to what you will do to comply with the Brady Bill. You will be in charge of conducting background checks on everyone in your county who wishes to purchase a handgun. They can't get it until you say so. And you have to do a criminal and mental history background check on them beforehand. And if you don't do it, well, you know... <laughs> There's this little provision in there that says you're subject to arrest. So you need to understand this is the first time in U.S. history that an unfunded mandate carries with it no money, it's unfunded, but a threat of arrest if we fail to comply. Now I know this sounds astonishing. I wouldn't believe it myself. So I'm going to show you the evidence as we go through. And it's also in this book. Scalia addresses it. And uh, uh, the other judges did as well. And so now, uh, the BATF agents leave the meeting, and you never heard so much cussing in your life. No sheriff like this. And we talked about all, you know, all the rest of the night. All, you know, I didn't get out of there until I waited the night, and then I have two and a half hours to drive home. And Finally, everybody started calming down, and the, the president of the association said, okay, what does each sheriff want to do? And they went around the table, and every sheriff got to say, what are we going to do? Every one of them, I hate it, I like it, I don't want to do it, but you can't fight City Hall. That came up time and time again. Who wants you to believe you can't fight City Hall? City Hall, especially the one in Washington, D.C., they don't want you peasants to think you can do anything with those pitchforks except toss hay. And that's where they want to keep you. And so, here I am, driving home, all by myself, brooding and brooding about this stupid radio, and not knowing what to do. What, what can we do now? No sheriff wants to do anything about it. And about halfway home, I'm in Globe, Arizona, and I make two decisions. There is no way I'm going to comply with this. And two, there's no way I'm going to quit my job over this. I'm not backing down. So, okay, well, you got yourself a quandary now, Mac. So then, I, I'm thinking the rest of the way home, what am I going to do? How am I going to reconcile this? And I'm driving up into my house, and it hits me. I'm going to sue my own government. I bet you're all just wondering how I'm going to tell the pretty little wonder of that. <laughs> and man, I wasted my 
always scared. <laughs> visibly, visibly shaken. I know I'm going to do it. And so I walk in the house, and there's the pretty little blonde girl, and she's coming up, oh, you're late, and she's going to hug me, and I said, I'm going to sue the Clinton administration. They're going to squash me like a little pumpkin seed. I hope you don't mind. It's going to cost us everything. <laughs> Good, I got it out. <laughs> and then I'm, then I'm getting ready for her to load her shotgun. And I'm like, you know, okay. She goes, what? Don't I get a kiss? And I said, yeah, but I really am going to sue the federal government. I'm going to sue the Clinton administration over this Brady Bill thing. And it's going to cost us everything. Home, career, job, whatever. Everything. And she goes, well, as I recall, we weren't really looking for a job when we landed this one. And I said, I'm going to take that as a yes. And she said, I don't understand all of what you're talking about, but I understand you. See, ladies, I want you to know something. She made the decision right there. I did. I don't know why she didn't say what most normal ladies would say. Are you nuts? We have five kids. Look at all we sacrificed to get this job. You want to just throw it away on some Don Quixote crusade? The windmills are real, man. They fight back. These are federal windmills. Clinton windmills. Hello. No, she didn't do any of that. In fact, she just kind of shrugged and went about making sure the kids were all in bed. The next morning, I go to work. Anybody want to tell me what I do now? I'm not a member of anything. I'm not a member of the NRA, JBS, any, I'm not a member of anything. Who can I turn to? I know. Call one of the lawyers down on Main Street and tell him I want to sue the federal government. <laughs> What's he going to say? Well, uh, uh, Sheriff, uh, <laughs> uh, did you talk this over with your wife? How about with the other sheriffs? Didn't they tell you you can't fight City Hall? Didn't your wife tell you this is kind of nutty? Well, if you had 20000 maybe I'll file it for you, but I'm not certified in the Supreme Court. But you're never going to make it there anyway. So why don't you just go back to your job and, anyway, you all know what a lawyer would say. And uh, so my undersheriff walks in because he is a member of the NRA. And I said, hey, Mike, does the NRA have like a toll-free number you can call and get advice and whatever? He goes, well, here's the card, here's the number. I don't know what you're going to get. And I said, okay. So I call it. I get put on hold a bunch. And, and Mike on the phone 20 minutes, still haven't talked to anybody. Finally, I land in the office of Richard Gardner. And he's a lawyer for the NRA. And I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, Sheriff, we've already been preparing the paperwork on this case, and we've been praying that you would call. I said, hallelujah. Finally get somewhere. I said, has anybody else called? And he goes, no, you're the first one. And I said, we're going to finally sue and prove to everybody in this com country that the Second Amendment establishes a God-given right to keep and bear arms, right? And he goes, calm down, Sheriff. We're not even suing on the Second Amendment. We have no standing on it, and neither do you. I said, you, you, you said you're preparing the paperwork. What are you preparing? You're the NRA. They said, you have standing on the Tenth Amendment. I said, the state tries to use Yeah. He said, the federal government can't tell you to do anything. I said, even better. <laughs> and I said, uh, but I want you to know, I really appreciate this. They're committing to finance this whole lawsuit. Yeah. They said, Sheriff, you won't have to worry about that. And I said, well, I want my own lawyer. I said, I really appreciate what you guys are doing and saying. I said, but I want this to be my case, not the NRA's. He said, that's fine with us. We'll work with your lawyer. And I said, can you recommend one out here in Arizona that knows the Second Amendment? He said, yes. Maybe Dave Hardy works in Tucson, lives in Tucson. I call Hardy, retain him as my lawyer. And on June, and on February 28, 1994, the very day the Brady Bill took effect, in Tucson, Arizona, in federal district court, my lawyers with the NRA lawyers filed a case, Mac versus the United States, regarding the Brady Bill. And um, 
We're going to start going through this now. And you're going to see some things that are going to astonish you. Remember, everything just about that we're going to look at, except the video clips, are documented in this book. And of the lawsuit itself, it's all in this little book. You can have it. It's in your hands. And you can share it with everybody else. Okay. We all take the same oath. And the very next day, we become liars and hypocrites. We don't care about it, and we don't pay any attention to it. We certainly never study it. There's the oath, and you'll see everywhere in this country, the United States Constitution is first. Nothing supersedes the U.S. Constitution. You can read most state constitutions, and all the state constitutions do is reinforce the federal constitution, especially when it comes to the right to keep and bear arms. Okay? State nullification, was that something I made up? Did I make state nullification up? This is something that Thomas Jefferson talked about in the Kentucky Resolution of 1798. And if you read in yellow, you'll see he says the states have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. And even go so far as to say that the states should refuse to enforce laws that they deem unconstitutional. This is a key point here, folks. Only the Supreme Court can say what's constitutional, right? In other words, we have created a nine-member oligarchy in Washington, D.C., and only they can say what is freedom in America. I take an oath, but I just turn it over to the courts. I take an oath, but I turn it over to my sergeant, to my chief, to my sheriff. I have a moral obligation to keep my word independently of anyone else. And if anybody or everybody else in government tells me I shouldn't keep my oath, and nobody else is, and nobody else follows the Constitution. What about when I know for a fact that the Supreme Court just violated the Constitution, I have to go along, or do I keep my oath then? That's quite the quandary. We're going to get into this a little bit more. But I would tell you, when it comes down to the bottom line, every public official your sheriffs, your county commissioners, have to know enough about the Constitution that they stand for your freedom before they follow the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court. The Constitution is always first. Now, that almost gives you the thing that, the idea that I'm saying, you're supposed to pick and choose. Just the opposite. There is not any oath taker, no one who swears an oath to the Constitution can pick and choose. He's already bound by oath to follow the Constitution. You cannot make any excuses why you don't keep that oath. So our first obligation is to know and understand the intent of those who frame the Constitution, and we have got to know and understand the Constitution. It's not rocket science. It's not that hard. There's not a lot of gray areas. When the Constitution or Bill of Rights starts with, Congress shall make no law. And when they do, I have an obligation to stand against it. Or the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep their homes, shall not be infringed. What's so hard about that? What part of infringed don't you understand? And when they come in to try to confiscate guns in my county, I can't go along with that. In fact, I have to stop. Hopefully, we can keep this peaceful. And this is my prayer and my goal and my quest, is that we will keep it peaceful. And if we get the sheriffs and other local officials on board the Freedom Train, this will remain peaceful and effective. Can you imagine 2,000 sheriffs? There's 3,100 sheriffs. Let's say 1,000. A third of the sheriffs in this country put the federal government on notice. You will not come in this county and do that again. It will not be tolerated. What is that, Boston? The 
It is. Do you know what you get when that happens? You get your country back. And we're not talking about later on or after somebody, you know, gets elected or whatever. It happens now. And that's the power we're talking about here, folks. And it's real. And it's lawful. And it's correct. And it's moral. And it's America. And it's a tea party. <laughs> You know, Madison called it, Madison called it, the theory and doctrine of interposition, that the state governments will actually interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. Now, that would never happen. How could that happen? The federal government wouldn't victimize us. Oh, that's hard to do. EPA ever victimize anybody? How about the IRS? Ever victimize anybody? And how about money you make from the IRS? Well, we're going to get into the IRS. The IRS is easy to pick up. There's nothing they do that's constitutional. <laughs> how about random audits? Sheriff, can you random conduct? No. I mean, you're, we're talking about a real life sheriff here. Can you conduct random audits on the citizens in your county to see if they abuse children? Isn't that more important than checking their finances? To see if they're abusing children? How about to see if they're cooking back? How about to see if they're stealing TVs from Walmart? Just conduct a random audit. Well, why won't you? The IRS does it all the time. It must be lawful. It must be constitutional. Well, I've had people say, well, Sheriff Mack, what are you nuts? How would the IRS collect if they didn't just do these random audits and random checks? And I said, I don't give a damn how they do it, as long as they follow the Constitution. And they can't, and they never have, so we might as well abolish it. They shouldn't be there in the first place. <laughs> who, can, uh, who can abolish the IRS? Will it be anybody in Washington, D.C.? No. Where do we make the IRS irrelevant? County. County. Okay, these are the two litigants, Jay Prince, Chef Prince from Montana, yours truly from Arizona. And I have to tell you, this is where this gets a little bit tough on me. This is a quote from Judge John Rowe. He was the judge that heard my case. He was killed four weeks ago today. On Tuesday. And uh, he changed my life. He was a great man. How he was ever there and the timing to take him out had to have been uh, astonishingly astronomical. But anyway, he said, in the first ruling of this entire ordeal, in this entire case, Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the law, subjecting himself to possible sanctions. He's talking about the threat of arrest that was aimed at us. At this point, I'm the only sheriff in the country. Uh, Prince joined the case about three or four weeks after we filed. And at this point, my lawyer says, don't you think we ought to get an injunction against the federal government? We actually got our injunction. And Janet Reno wrote a memo to the judge saying, you don't need the injunction. We're not going to arrest Sheriff Mack or any other sheriff that doesn't comply. The threat of arrest was only aimed at the gun shop owners. Now, let me show you then the threat of arrest. We'll come back to some of these after this. There it is. Under a separate provision of the Gun Control Act, uh, the Brady Bill modified the Gun Control Act in 1968, so yes, it was gun control. Any person who knowingly violates the section of the Gun Control Act amended by the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title imprisoned for no more than one year or both. Does that just say the gun shop owners? No. And Judge Roll, in his ruling, when we got our injunction granted, said, quote, Janet Reno doesn't get to change the law or interpret the law by memo. He actually said by fiat. And we got our injunction. Do you realize what that is? That's an order of protection for me against the Clinton administration. 
Look at all the people that got orders of protection against Bill Clinton in history. I was the only one to get one on a non-sexual matter. <laughs> What did George Mason, founding father from Virginia, say about the militia? What did all the founding fathers say about the militia? Richard Henry Lee, another founding father, see what he said about the militia. I asked, sir, what is the militia? It is the whole people themselves. To disarm the people is the best and most effectual way to enslave them. That's from the framers. Now do you know why we get a little upset when our leaders who have sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution, try to shove gun control on our throats. It's enslaving, always has been. Never through history has gun control ever been used to provide peace, safety, or freedom. Ever. Not once. And now there's something magical about it in America. Let me tell you, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, John McCain, I don't care who they are, I don't care what party they are. Let me tell you something loud and clear. Gun control in America is against the law. Read it for yourself. And I know there's a lot of smart politicians from California. Barbara Boxer, Diane Weinstein, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, Arnold, and now Jerry Brown. I know they're really smart. There's not a one of them, or all of them together, that are halfway as smart as George Washington, or Ben Franklin, or Thomas Jefferson, or any of the other founders. And I'll follow them way before I follow these, whatever they are here in California. Okay? And there's a lot of good people in California. And I love California, mostly because I love people about you. And I travel the country, and I see the same thing. In your eyes, every time I go, it's the same faces, same eyes that are just saying, why don't we follow the Constitution for a while? We're just Americans, and we want to be left alone. Don't feed us. Don't clothe us. Don't educate us. Don't provide any health care. Leave us alone, and let's see how it goes. Where do you get off the bus? She said, two blocks up on down. 
And he says, can we make sure you get home safely? There could be trouble tonight for you. And he and his deputy escort Rosa home. And then they make sure that her husband's shotgun is loaded. And he does have a shotgun. And it is loaded. And the sheriff says, we're going to give you extra patrol. And my deputy is going to make sure that you get an extra patrol all night long and the next day. But we can't be here every minute, so make sure you keep your shotgun in. That's how it should have happened. By somebody who has a badge who swore to, to uphold and defend the Constitution and swore to protect the rights of all Americans. And we don't just do it for the white ones or black ones or green ones or yellow ones or anyone else. And we've got to all understand that America is for everybody that's here legally. That's the only exception we make. But we're still fair enough to them as we send them. This is what Ronald Reagan said about our tax structure. He's talking about the IRS here. Our federal tax system is, in short, utterly impossible, utterly unjust, and completely counterproductive. It reeks of injustice and is fundamentally un American. It has earned rebellion in this time period. Ago. The only thing is he didn't quite do enough to stop it. And now it's up to us. There is nothing that's lawful or correct or right about what's going on in our tax structure. And I'm going to echo something that uh, Ron Paul said. Because I was getting all confused about this tax thing. You know, do we want a fair tax, a graduating tax, a flat rate tax, a sale, national sales tax? And Ron, uh, Ron, Ron, to Ron set me straight. And I went like this. I had a V8 moment. Yeah, that is right. <laughs> we abolished the IRS. We abolished the federal income tax. We abolished the Federal Reserve, and we replaced them with nothing. Right. And that's why I have said, and I have said it, and this is true, I've said a lot of radical things. Well, not too many. Time Magazine said I lied earlier. Time Magazine lied about me in their October 11th edition, just so you know that, okay? It was a big pack of lies, except for the part where I said, I do pray for the day when a sheriff in this country has the courage to arrest a real enemy, a couple of IRS agents. I said that. I believe it. I feel it. And you know what? I love to be the kind of people. And right now, I'll tell you honestly, there's a group of people trying to get me to move over to Tucson to run against Sheriff Duke. in the palm of your hand, and you can share it with everybody you know, especially your local politicians. Your state rep should get this from you by tomorrow, okay? Because Scalia, the U.S. Supreme Court said, we have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Don't you wish they knew that? We can show them. It's in there. This is the political correctness of both major street, uh, main street parties, okay? And I'm not bad about any either party. I'm bad about the system that they have been <coughs> a part of and that they perpetuate. Yes. And now, I'm only interested in candidates and I don't care what party. If they can't quote and say the word constitution without choking, I'm not voting. <laughs> This is back to the decision. All of this is in this booklet. It is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. Although the states surrendered many of their powers to the new federal government, they retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. Don't you think that if California was inviolably sovereign, that they'd be able to run uh, their own farms? Who has become the enemy? Now, I have said this, and it's in my book, and it's on my website. But I got one of the founding fathers to back me up on it. 
I have said the greatest threat to our God-given constitutional American liberty is our own federal government. It doesn't please me to say it. I wish that God wasn't true, but it is. And then uh, Madison explains it this way. I just don't talk like founding fathers. I'm going to have to go to that school again. Madison said there are more instances, this is on page 19, of the abridgment of freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments from those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. See, he, he said the same thing I said. I just said it a little bit differently and kind of applied it today. Kind of. It's the exact same thing. He is telling us where to be careful. What did Jefferson tell us? Bind these politicians down with the chains of the Constitution. Have we done it? No. Then they're certainly not going to do it. And so we have got to start. If we had four people in each county doing that, binding politicians down with the Constitution, we would. Maybe a couple of board of supervisors county commissioners, a sheriff, and just a good measure throw in the county You don't have to have it, and I even put that in the book. Most of them will tell the sheriff he can't do it, so you don't ask him. His opinion doesn't matter any more than the barber down on Street. In fact, I trust the barber more. <laughs> Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers. Don't you wish they knew that? They don't have all governmental powers. The Constitution doesn't give them all governmental powers, but only discrete enumerated ones. And where can we see that? Article 1, Section 8, U.S. Constitution. By the way, how many police powers does the the enumerated powers of Article 1, Section 8 grant to the federal government. Don't say zero, it's not zero. It's almost zero, but it's not zero. Let's name them. Felonies committed on the high seas, piracies, counterfeit, treason. <laughs> Don't you wish the FBI would investigate you? <laughs> so, counterfeiting, treason, Felonies committed on my seas, and in section, I think it was Article 10, that requires them to protect our borders from invasion. Good job. Yeah. They're tearing down. Okay. But only the three enumerated ones. The entire purpose of the Constitution was to do what? Limit what government can do. These are the strict perimeters that the government has to stay in. Okay, then what's the purpose of the Bill of Rights? It takes that to the next power, to the tenth power, it takes it to the next level. We are coming up with ten basic fundamental principles of freedom that government or politicians can never talk about, think about, or do anything about changing, altering, encroaching upon or otherwise altering these basic human rights. And then they listen to them, and you know who ratified the Bill of Rights? The states. The, th the 13 original states. Who formed the federal government? The 13 original states. Do any of you think for a moment that the founding fathers just got through fighting King George III so they could establish a new federal government to tell us what to do and control every facet of our lives. Of course not. They only, with very strict trepidation and a lot of fear and a lot of work and blood, sweat, and tears went into the war and into the formulation to make sure there could never be a repetition of what King George III did. And it was called the American Constitution and it was called the Bill of Rights. And now we have the Bill of Rights, and the tenth is the ultimate check and balance on federal tyranny. And that's what Scalia is telling us as he takes us through this history lesson, which implication was rendered express by the Tenth Amendment's assertion that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited 
by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Also shows you how much power the people retain. We are as powerful as the states. And if we have to become a Tea Party to take this back, we will. But just so each of you know, Barack Obama and all the rest of you lie and corrupt politicians. We will do this peacefully. And with help from our local officials, we'll keep it that way. Okay? Next. The great innovation of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities. One state, one federal. Read the next one. Each protected from incursion by the other. You know what an incursion is? It's an entry. Trust that. Who's supposed to protect you from the incursion of the federal government? The state. Should we allow the counties and cities to have a little fun with that too? Or would that be granting ourselves too much power? Well, let's go to the next one and see what uh, James Madison says. Madison said that the local or municipal authorities, who are the local or municipal authorities? Cities and counties form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. Well, Barack Obama is trying to sue Arizona right now on the supremacy clause. How is it that we already share in the supremacy and he sues us to take the supremacy away? No, he's saying that the supremacy clause grants all supremacy to the federal government. We already know that the federal government can't have that because the founding fathers were trying to stop that when they formed the Constitution in the first place. What does the supremacy clause actually say? Scalia clarifies it right here. He talks about the supremacy clause. He said the supremacy clause just says the Constitution is free and takes us right back to why, why the sheriffs are here in the first place. Can the federal government commandeer sheriffs for federal bidding? Yeah. Unless you go to law. All right. This separation of the two spheres, the federal sphere and the state sphere, he's literally talking now about state sovereignty. State sovereignty, he's saying, is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. Folks, we might as well go on back to bed, I guess, huh? We, we kind of waste our time here because we're not talking about anything important here, are we? We're only talking about these little structural protections of liberty. What else? Uh, come on. A structural protection of liberty. It's our foundation. And we have allowed it to be destroyed with programs and politics and corruption and greed. And now, we're taking it back. It's called the American Tea Party movement. Just as the separation, as he agreed, just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. My dear friends, my fellow Californians, my fellow Americans, when you came to this meeting and when you joined the Tea Party movement, did you want to do that so you would know how to reduce the risk of tyranny? Scalia just showed us. It cannot happen without a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government. Do we have that balance today? Of course not. That's ridiculous to even think about that. Let's keep going. He gets even stronger. Folks, did I tell you that everything you're seeing there is in this little thing? Can you imagine that much being in this little thing? I don't know how it is. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other. At the same time, that each is controlled by itself. Got a question for you there? Any question in anyone's mind here at all as to whether or not the federal government is going to control itself? <laughs> Why are you laughing? That's not a joke. <laughs> She's good. It is a joke. You ask anybody. I don't know. We're going to control this up. Everybody starts laughing. That's been the response. And let me tell you, from Maui to Bangarang, and I'm telling you.
telling you, I love that one now. But they've got a tea party group there, and it's a good one. And uh, I told them to invite me back about every three months. <laughs> Now, I 
way, you know, you want to play this little extortion game? Let me tell you, the state of California and its citizens will no longer send any money to Washington, D.C. Ever. Do you see the power you've got right there? The state of California will run and keep it, will run its own state and keep its own money here. I'll move here. Now there's other states I think are going to beat California now. Surprise them. But there's some that are actually considered doing this very good. Including Oklahoma. Uh, maybe. Virginia's a tough too. There's my favorite quote from the entire decision. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Have you ever heard of such a problem? If everyone, no, no, no. If 25% of all politicians in Washington, scratch Washington, in California, knew and understood and lived by that one line in yellow, but the Constitution protects us, from our own best intentions, you'll get your freedom back tomorrow. Because this puts everything in proper constitutional perspective. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. Have you heard that crisis of the day? It's the mantra of the Obama administration. It's called TARP. Yeah. As long as you have a good crisis, don't let it go to waste. Even if you have to make it out. This is our country. This is our state. This is our freedom. That we're allowing to slip away. We're allowing and actually walking as America does. And the question is, are you going to answer the call to put America back where she's supposed to be? That's what the Tea Party movement is about. I told the reporter uh, from Time Magazine, why don't you examine what they have done to create the Tea Party movement? We were all just sitting around and saying, gosh, I wish we could form a Tea Party movement. That isn't what happened. We saw corrupt government, and we said, we're not going to take it anymore, and we're going to stand against it. We want to be left alone, and we want the Constitution followed by the very leaders that promised they would uh, call and defend it. Isn't that too much to ask? Good grief, you guys. Why are you checking on us and labeling us? Check what caused this. And examine it for yourself. If you don't see any violation of the Constitution by Congress, then we'll leave you alone. But even you liars in the media won't be able to cover up that. No way. You can't lie that much. <laughs> this is the order of the court. Start in the yellow. This is Judge Scalia, Justice Scalia, issuing the bottom line of this entire decision. He says, the federal government may neither issue directives Requiring the states to address particular problems. Do they ever do that? <laughs> they can't do it. It's against the law. Nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions. Make sure we define the political subdivisions of the state. School boards, counties, and cities. Did I miss it? I think that's basically it. To administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. End quote. Folks, does it get any more powerful than this? Did you want it to say something more? They can't tell us what to do. Now, uh, somebody's going to have to explain this to me. The federal government can't tell us what to do, and we are sovereign, but the EPA can tell us what to do. <coughs> or the IRS, or the FBI, or 
or DEA or Department of Education or DHS. Or, man, I could be up here until tomorrow and still not have all of them said. Folks, it's our country and it's our state. If we acquiesce and go along, we're endorsing what they're doing. Okay, we can't do that. Now this part up here where it says, no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary, came directly from the cross-examination that I was experienced in Judge John Gold's courtroom from the lawyer of the federal government. She, I was on the stand, and she comes up and starts hammering on me pretty hard, and I'm Amy was pretty good. And all of a sudden she stops and she addresses the judge, Judge Roy. And she says, Why are you on there? In just the first four months of the implementation of the Lady Background Checks, we've already denied 250,000 felons from gaining access to guns in this country. I'm sitting there wondering where in the world she came up with all these lying statistics. Why do we have 250,000 felons on the streets of this country? All trying to buy a gun in a government owned and checked gun store. I, come on, they can't be that stupid. And while I'm thinking that, just instantly, Judge Roll interrupted me and he, he rebuked the attorney. And he said, Counselor, do not try to pretend in this courtroom that your statistical analysis somehow equates to constitutionality. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of man we lost four weeks ago. You see what? I've never experienced such a principled judge, especially a federal in my life. On page 19 of my book, uh, From My Code Dead Fingers, my second amendment book, he's on page 19. His ruling was Congress exceeded its authority under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, thereby impermissibly encroaching upon the powers retained by the states pursuant to the Tenth Amendment. This was a great man. This was a great movement. But it only is as powerful as the people there to make sure that it's used. And this has been hidden from me. A lot of you didn't hear anything about this, did you? It's all true. You've seen it? Take it home. Okay? Now, do you remember, uh, and I'm going to close. Do you remember that police training I went to? Back when I was converted to the Constitution? It was police training. And at one point, Dr. Skousen got up on the stage, kind of a podium area, and he had all 240 of us big, tough cops. And he taught us a little kindergarten exercise. And I never forgot it. And when he handed me his book, The Making of America, you see, folks, in 16 hours of training, police training, we didn't discuss the Miranda decision. We didn't discuss police safety tactics. We talked about the making of America. We learned about the founding fathers. You cannot bypass these bases and understand the rest. And so he handed me his book. And he and I kind of struck up a friendship because during breaks, I would tell him about my father and he remembered my father and where they worked and stuff in the FBI. And so when he handed me my book, The Making of America, he gave it to all 240 of us. Big old hardback book. And he said, promise me that you'll teach these things to your children. I promise you. And I've done it. And now I teach them all across the country. I never thought that would be the case. But I also started teaching them to my grandchildren. And the oldest one was just barely four and a half. And I gotta tell you though, my oldest grandchild was a little girl, and she was born on the 4th of July. And her name is Liberty. <laughs> Liberty the Don Hart. And everybody needs a little Liberty. And I've got two of them, hopefully. We've got to get our other one back. I've got Libby, now I want my other one back. And it's for her. And it's to you that I dedicate this closing. And I do this closing everywhere I go. It doesn't matter where I do this. And I 
dedicated to each one of you and to your little lives and to your children and to the family of fathers, to Judge Rolls, to Dr. Scout, who changed my life, both of those great patriots did. And I want you to remember while I share this with you, that I learned this at police training. And I call it America's political prayer. And it goes like this. I need my hands. Do I need a mic? Do I need a mic?